In the headlines tonight, reaction from several quarters to the 2023 budget. A man in custody assisting police as they probe an altercation involving a police officer. Bus service to resume on the original Borden St. Andrew route. And in sports, Barbados named a 23-strong team to the Carifta Games. Broadcasting from our studios in the Pine St. Michael, this is CBC Newsnight, starting now. Hello, I'm Shane Seely, leading our news tonight. Three of the island's leading financial and accounting agencies have weighed in on the budget and do have concerns about inflation. Wendy Burt reviewed the reports of Deloitte, PricewaterhouseCoopers and KPMG and tells us the areas of the 2023 to 2024 budget which stood out for them. The absence of new taxes featured in the analysis of Deloitte's 2023 budget review, and they see the Prime Minister's main focus was unlocking growth. The creation of the National Growth Council, Fiscal Council and National Strategic Council were mentioned. The agency also noted there was no mention of the current pandemic contribution levy, which is set to end on March 31st. Pensioners' tax relief through personal income tax allowance from $40,000 to $45,000 was highlighted. And Deloitte also did a sample calculation to show how their spending power increased. Other areas highlighted were the transfer pricing legislation, new regulatory frameworks such as the new 2022 customs tariff, business surveys, re-registration of the warehouse and duty-free shopping sectors. They believe these measures will allow the Barbados government to monitor, audit and assess contributions to the economy from this concession. KPMG, in addressing mission transformation, took notice of some key snapshots, such as the $2.8 billion in foreign reserves, the 8.5% inflation, 10% GDP growth, the fiscal surplus of $50.3 million, and Barbados's B rating. The 28-page document divided the budget into themes and gave their viewpoints on them. In the area of economic and fiscal measures, they looked at the $25,000 loan to postal workers for electric vehicles, as well as the $3 million low interest revolving fund through fund access for public service vehicles to get electric or hybrid vehicles. KPMG sees this as reducing costs to postal workers and providing favorable costs of funding for PSVs. In the area of the film industry, which is getting a 25% transferable tax credit on eligible expenses, the agency believes it has the potential to create growth in another productive sector and also create employment. PwC, in its 23-page analysis, took a different approach to mission transformation, saying it contained a broad range of initiatives focused on economic growth and investment opportunities. One of the areas they highlighted is the global minimum corporate tax, which the Prime Minister indicated she would revisit within six months. PwC believes that with the OECD having released its final guidelines for how countries can bring the new global minimum corporate tax, and they believe a number of issues have to be addressed to find a suitable framework for Barbados, which will still make us an attractive place to do global business. PwC also looked at the training on offer to public servants and the many infrastructural projects in the tourism sector. They see the budget, which is encouraging Barbadians to work to a future together, as one where the strategic goals need to be further detailed and developed before the implementation stage. Wendy Burke, CBC News. Thank you, Wendy. Now, reaction to the budget has been swift. In response, economist Dr. Justin Ram described the budget as positive. He notes citizens should be relieved that there were no new taxes. Mr. Ram was among the panel for the CBC 2023 budget analysis. There also seems to be considerable relief being given to the population in terms of perhaps welfare payments, but and in terms of increases in salaries, which we knew were, were announced um, a few weeks ago, but again, we confirmed in the budget. Um, and of course, um, with respect to other measures around trying to build social capital, for example. But I would say that in my mind, the most promising thing that I've heard in the budget um, this afternoon from the Prime Minister was her focus on growth. 
um, an area that I think that the Barbados economy has been particularly lagging behind. Though describing the budget as a decent one, political analyst Peter Wickham suggests there will be disappointment in some quarters regarding issues not dealt with in the Prime Minister's presentation. In terms of the relief being offered, presumably relief will be offered later, but there the clearly is, this was a, a budget that was more or less intent, intended to stabilize and to speak to government's policy going forward. Um, like, like Justin, I'm, I'm happy that we're hearing of some major initiatives that are likely to start, the fact that we've broken ground on a new hospital. I mean, we do need a few major construction projects to get the economy going, and it's good to hear that these things will be happening in fairly short order, so that's also a relief. Um, on a more global sense, though, uh, I am I'm comfortable with the fact that the budget presented what is essentially a seven-year plan. The Democratic Labour Party is also having it say the DLP is contending that the effects of the budget will be negligible. The budget talks about 2030 being for a uh, mission, mission development and, and Barbados to become a world class society by 2030 when the actual contents of the budget does not allow for that, uh, does not present that particular situation. To say I am disappointed uh, would be an understatement. Major incentives were announced last night by Prime Minister Mia Amor Motley aimed at driving the local film production industry. Let's take a listen. 25% transferable tax credit on eligible expenses directly related to the pre-production, production and post-production of their films, which include all local costs and foreign cast and crew if paid via a Barbadian production company. Two. Suppliers such as studio and film equipment renters that are registered as exclusive film providers are exempt from value-added tax. Three, eligible expenses include above the, both above the line and below the line expenses, with the exception of distribution and marketing costs, finance costs and bank charges, and completion bond and foreign insurance policies. It should be completion bonds and foreign insurance policies. Payments to foreign cast and crew, if made via a Barbadian company, are subject to only 1% withholding tax. Now joining us live to examine the impact of those incentives on the local film industry is co-founder and managing director of 13 Degrees North Productions Incorporated, Kirk Dawson. Kirk, good to have you on Newsnight. Straight away, what do you like about these incentives announced by the Prime Minister for the local film industry? Shane, um, good night, Barbados. Um, Shane, this is a wonderful initiative. Um, it is something that we have been pushing and driving for for over 15 years. And to be seen as a sector poised for growth makes us extremely, extremely happy. Um, my wife and I is sitting on the committee, the steering committee for this initiative and for film, along with the Ministry of Culture and the Film Commissioner and the BFBA. Um, it, is, it is wonderful to actually see this happen now. Um, the international market has always been asking, and international producers have always been asking, if we do have tax incentives, what would stimulate them to, to look at Barbados and to come to Barbados to produce films? So with this initiative now, um, it definitely sets the platform to attract that foreign exchange into the Barbados economy, and we can now really push and, and attract that investment in. However, um, I will say that we haven't seen the final bill, so we can't exactly, sh we can't be 100% sure as, as to the fine print, but I'm very, very, very happy that this initiative has come to the forefront. Uh, as part of the measures, we have also heard that about 15% of jobs have to be from the host country Barbados. Your thoughts on this? Right. So, uh, that is something that we have um, been driving. So to have 15% to start with, because obviously Prime Minister is saying that we will grow to 25 once we can, once we have the capacity on ground. Now, for us here at 13 Degrees North, we are a big fan of knowledge exchange. So for years we've been saying, let's bring in the international productions, let's train our local um, filmmakers, our, our cultural practitioners to learn to do, to do the jobs within the sector and then we won't necessarily need to have those heads of departments coming back 
we can then fill those um, jobs with locals. So that in itself is great. However, um, there are more incentives that, that I'm hoping is a part of, of it um, with, in terms of cultural tests. So we just have to wait now and see what else um, has been put forward in the paper. Well, it really puts Barbados on the big stage, and we really hope for more advancements in the local film industry. We really want to thank you, Kirk, as well, for spending the time with us here on Newsnight to discuss this issue in terms of the incentives for the local film sector. You're welcome. Appreciate, Thank you for having me. Appreciate your time. Now, MPs, meanwhile, stood in defense of the government and the budget presentation as they contributed to the debate in Parliament today. Minister of Environment and National Beautification Adrian Ford is telling the country the budget has inspired hope and confidence in Barbadians. He says the budget will help people every day. There were a lot of goodies there. I tell you, I had the goodies. And we have now the new um, constant, the diabetic monitoring machines, too. Because we, when we met you, we, we can test you. That's what we we'll be saying. But it was a budget that spoke to the transformation in all the sectors across Barbados. You, hear, you, you heard yesterday what is happening with the world works, man, all across this country. And how there will, be, there will be a rehabilitation program for even not only the major roads, but the minor arteries as well. That's what you heard yesterday. You heard about the construction that is going to be happening across this country. And Member of Parliament for Christchurch West, Chris Gibbs, has welcomed uh, the measures he believes can help diversify the local economy. He highlighted plans to develop that local film industry, which he says will also help create jobs for young people. Mr. Gibbs also spoke about efforts to develop a tissue culture lab. Which will be key to boosting our exports in produce and value added produce to the markets at the UK and the US. So as she said, we'd be glad to get back to the days where we will put sweet potatoes and you'll find sweet potatoes in UK supermarkets, sir. These measures are needed to again create resilience, sir through being self-sufficient in earning more foreign exchange and achieving the goal of diversifying our economy. We are also hearing that government is moving ahead with plans to introduce parole to the local justice system. Speaking during the debate on the appropriations bill, the Minister of Home Affairs, Wilfred Abrams, revealed it's expected to be rolled out sometime in the upcoming financial year. Last year, January, January, Minister Abrams indicated that his ministry was examining the implication of a system of early release. Those prisoners who qualify would be allowed to spend part of their sentence outside of the prison setting. It is our intention, sir, that before the end of this financial year, that we would have in place a parole system. And we will have in place the electronic monitoring system, sir, that persons, instead of being remanded, um, if, you, if you should get bail, but we're not certain that you can stay where you're supposed to stay, then you're one of those people that we clap an ankle bracelet on you, and your family feeds you because you're at home. So these are initiatives, sir, that we're looking not as generating income, but as helping the government to save money where money can be saved. Minister Abrams says over the next year, there will also be comprehensive training programs at the island's correctional facilities. With the adults at Dodds, we're looking to have the social programs, increased counselling, increased rehabilitative and training initiatives. We're looking to push the educational aspect. We're back out of the restriction of COVID now, sir, that we can start the programs back fully. The farming program has accelerated. We are now almost self-sufficient in the provision of fish and vegetables. Um, sir, the chicken farming program has gone back up again. Black belly sheep. The aim, sir, within the next two years is to make the prison self-sufficient in all the food that it reasonably can. Well, a police officer injured during an altercation at the Barbados Licensing Authority. We'll have the details to that story and more when we return. An off-duty police officer was injured during an altercation today with a man at the Barbados Licensing Authority in the Pine St. Michael. Police are still gathering information relating to what transpired. However, Police Communications and Public Affairs Officer Inspector Rodney Innes confirmed that a person of interest is in custody. 
can say yes, a police officer who um, was injured in, a, in an altercation with another individual. Our investigations is still at a sensitive stage, as you can appreciate. And before giving much facts on, on that particular matter, yes, he was taken to the Queen Elizabeth Hospital where he was he's recovering. We understand the, light, the injuries are not life-threatening. At this stage, and we have a person of interest in custody dealing with that particular matter. We will certainly update you with that matter as well. Meanwhile, a short time ago, police set up a command center in the area of Imart on Two Mile Hill and have cordoned off the area. This is lawmen and fire officials investigate the discovery of a suspect package at the Lloyd Erskine Sanford Center, which forced evacuation of the facility. Well, Shane, we've received a report about 20 minutes past 4 o'clock from the fire personnel indicating that they have received a report of a suspicious object uh, in one of the rooms, a bathroom, uh, the like Erskine Sandiford Center. Obviously, that triggered a, a response from both fire and police, and we are about going about the process to, to really check that object, make sure it's all safe. So we have evacuated the building. And we have re-diverted traffic from the JTC Ramsey around the boat, otherwise known as the bus around the boat, and the area down by the community college, Hollows Cross Road, so that there's no vehicle traffic passing directly along in front of the Lloyd Erskine Sandyford Center. It has caused considerable disruption, as you can appreciate, and we are asking motorists to please understand what we're trying to do, make it safe for all of us. In other news on Newsnight, local tourism officials have been working around the clock, transforming Haywood's Beach for the arrival of the mega cruise ship, the Arvia. Well, the event will see Barbados welcoming not only the vessel for the naming ceremony in the waters off the West Coast Beach, but key international figures will be a part of the historic event. The event is expected to be a further catalyst for the tourism sector, with millions of people having the opportunity to watch the proceedings live on YouTube. P&O Cruises is facilitating the live stream, and its officials will join top local tourism officials as well tomorrow around half past three in the afternoon. News of relief for residents of Bodens and other surrounding areas in St. Andrew. The St. Andrew's church bus will be back soon. This was revealed by Chief Operations Officer of the Transport Board, Linda Holder. She says this return to the original service passing through Bodens will start this Sunday. She was speaking after a final test run of a bus crossing over Bodens temporary bypass road. The service over the bridge was rerouted in April last year after the Bodens bridge was deemed unsafe and subsequently closed. A sturdier, more durable temporary bypass road has been constructed, which will allow heavy duty vehicles to cross. Travel time for commuters on the Shorey Village and St. Andrew's Church routes are expe is expected to be greatly reduced. With the reopening of this bridge, we will now be able to realign our services and have the St. Andrew's Church come back to its original route, which means it will come directly over the bridge and be able to transport persons over into Belplain on that end. More importantly, our Ali school bus will be able to then come back on this route and instead of having to do the back and forth and the twisting around, and the students will be able to get to school. We're hopeful in a more timely manner. At least the, the distance being traveled will not be as long. Also on that test drive were other officials from the Transport Board as well as the Parliamentary Representative for St. Andrew, Dr. Rommel Springer. He says he's pleased with the returning bus service. Even though we're here today and we are fully reopening this road to, um, to public transportation, that this is not a permanent structure. This road is meant to be temporary and it will remain so until such time as we complete the bridge, which we have already um, started the process of doing. We have gotten the plans, um, the designs for the actual bridge, which will be a precast uh, culvert. This will be done by Preconco, and then at some point it will be placed in, in, in the actual uh, canal, and then from there we will build the bridge. Sports Night is brought to you by PowerAid. Feel the power and the sunny water. Connect mind and body. Let's go over to Amory now to get the latest sports. Amory, good to have you. It seems like the Shanes are dominating your headlines in sports. 
Here we go again now, Shay. This time we have cricket news. A captain is not from Shay. Norwich has rescued the Barbados Spice first innings against the Leeward Island Hurricanes as round three of the Cricket West Indies four day championship got underway today in Port of Spain, Trinidad. Winning the toss and batting at the Queen's Park Oval. The Pride closed today on 294 for eight. Norwich is undefeated on 116. That so far includes nine fours and a six, while Shem Holder has added 43. Dorich and Holder added 73 for the eighth wicket, while he and Kevin Wickham, who scored 41, put on 92 for the fifth. Rakeem Karwa has taken six for 50. Miwa in Tarbo hosts Trinidad and Tobago Red Force Trail Ghana Harpy Eagles by 317 runs. Scores their Guyana 324, Trinidad 7 without loss. And in Providence, Guyana, Jamaica Scorpions trail the win with Volcanoes by 119 runs with only three first in its wickets in hand. Scores win with 217, Jamaica 98 for 7. Well, the Athletic Association of Barbados has named a 23-member team for the upcoming 50th Caribbean Games in Nassau, Bahamas. The team was released this afternoon via their social media pages and includes in the under-17 girls, Alika Harewood, Anaya Nurse, Ashlyn Simmons, Ariel Archer, Shanicia Bryan, and Kadia Rock. The under-17 boys, Errol Messiah, Caden Dowish Roach, and Luke McIntyre. Under-20 girls, Asabi Kahn. Brianna Boyce, Layla Haynes, Crystal Martindale, and Naya Brown. And the other 20 boys is Amari Knight, Amir Gustav, Argon Straker, Fabian Gollop, Finn Armstrong, Jadon Pierce, Josiah Paris, Nikolai Kennedy, and Tashawn Seeley. The Power A, the Sunny Water B South Field Events competition was completed today at the school grounds of Harrison College. Here's a look at some of the day's events. Final day of the field events. Final day to pick up valuable points going into the track competition. And the morning session produced some more good performances all around. You can call them the babies of Visa, first timers to the Javni event. But these junior boys showed good technique and decent measurements. And when all was said and done, Christchurch Foundation's Kai White, with a throw of 33.58 meters, claimed the bronze medal. Silver went to Zarel Harding of Corrigan Parry with a farthest throw of 34.10 meters. And your winner from the St. Leonard's Boys with a best throw of 34.46 meters was Jaden Chase. From the junior boys to the seniors and their shot put event, where third was claimed by Jairo Malcolm of Parkinson Memorial with a putt of 12.94 meters. Christchurch Foundation's Caden Hoyt was second with a best throw of 13.58 meters. And your winner from Queen's College, having won the discus event, adding the shot put to his resume with a measurement of 14.32 meters is Aidan Greenwich, and he was delighted with his performances. To be honest with you, I didn't have any expectations coming into the competition. I just went and gave my best. I tried to have fun, and I'm very happy with my results. I am ecstatic. I was looking forward to it. This is something that I genuinely look forward to every year and just happy to win both of them. Also winners joined the under-17 boys triple jump was the St. Michael's School's Aaron Messiah, whose farthest sleep was a 14.11 meters. And with that, the attention will now turn to the track with the first zone set to run off from tomorrow. And that zone will be the Frank Blackman zone tomorrow at the Usain Bolt Complex. It features Corrigan and Parry, Daryl Jordan Secondary, Les Savon, Princess Margaret, Queen's College, the St. Winifred School, the Ellerslie School, the St. Michael School and the Ursuline Convent. The action is set to start at 10 a.m. Well, Gooding House dethroned Trotman House as LRC School held their sports day at the USA Boat Complex recently. Gooding identified as green, amassed 859.5 points, with Trotman red in second, 622. Third was Bathway, that's gold, 552.5, with Strawn Blue House bringing up the rear with 539 points. CBC's Damien Best was there for the relays. Under 15 girls next, Strawn House hoping to dethrone Trotman this year. But that would require a big effort in these relays. Red was up front for the most part. But that blue army saved the best for last. It was just a matter of the time because this one was over early. Red fading. 
good in house taking over that second position the winning time 57.46 seconds blue house were already top of the podium in three prior races well we'll have to make that four out of six they overtook red house in whirlwind fashion to leave it all up to the anchor leg to deliver the final knockout punch shoulder to shoulder side by side red right in the mix who wants it the most lane five into overdrive the blue wave continues 49.72 seconds red 50.12 green that's good in 51.45 under 20 girls now trotman house not taking any chances they went out with pure speed and purpose the record here 53 seconds flat set by greenhouse back in 1973 well this performance looks special with each leg sprinting to hand over the baton and with just 100 meters to go there was great optimism that a 50 year old record could tumble post it fax it send the message red house are the new record holders in the four by 100 meter relays for under 20 girls 52.70 seconds three cheers for the effort green in second position 57.71 third going to gold 59.69 what will the under 20 boys bring to the table the record 44.72 seconds set by blue house in 2005 green was definitely in a class of its own here blue red and gold weren't even in the frame when green started their ankle leg this was a punishing performance to say the least what a way to close out sports in 2023 the time not a record but good 45.75 seconds blue way back in second 49.07 gold third 49.24 ellersley bringing the curtain down on secondary school house sports for 2023 The local banking community is not overly concerned about the collapse of the Silicon Valley Bank in California and any ripple impact here. That's the word tonight from the head of the Bankers Association of Barbados and Managing Director of Republic Bank of Barbados, Anthony Clerk. He says the banking system in Barbados is a heavily regulated industry. He also points out that banks in Barbados have a risk department and the requirements of the central bank would prevent such an occurrence. The main cause of the failure is uh, that they were invested in long-dated securities and with the increase in interest rates uh, in the states, uh, they have lost value on that portfolio, their bond portfolio. And that is what really was the cause of their, of their problems, their liquidity problems. The banks in Barbados do not invest in long-dated securities. We, we invest generally in short-dated short securities. So if there is an uh, increase in interest rates, uh, we would not be significantly impacted. Local manufacturers will be among those encouraged to register on a regional portal that connects buyers and sellers. The CARICOM Marketplace and Suspension Procedure, or CIM Supro, was launched late last year. Minister of State in Foreign Trade and Business, Sandra Husbands, believes it will help boost regional trade. This is going to be followed up, sir, by the CARICOM Secretariat doing promotions in a number of islands in order to encourage manufacturers to put their goods there. This is the only way we're going to boost sales and therefore get the economic growth that is going to give jobs to Barbadians and earn the foreign exchange which we need. The worst thing we can do is to be creating more and more entrepreneurs and you do not have market space for them to be able to be successful. All we will do is create a feeding frenzy where the, the, the enterprises are gobbling up each other and cannibalizing each other and the economy cannot grow under those conditions. Thanks for visiting us. Now, if you want to see more stories like this one, like and subscribe to our YouTube channel. And you can always go to cbc.bb for the latest news and current affairs.